I will take this piece of chicken, put a piece of tinfoil over it, and I'll just kind of crush it down a little bit. It'll break all the sinew inside of this this chicken thigh, and it'll just make it so that when you bite into it, you can get a clean, succinct bite. Hello and welcome to My Signature Dish. My name is Ollie Horn. It's great to have you here. This is the podcast where I meet incredible home cooks, find out what their story is, where they get their inspiration from, and discuss their signature dish. If you're new to the podcast, then thank you very much for checking us out. If you're back here after listening to Matthew's episode last week and have come back for more, then you're not going to be disappointed with this conversation. Danny goes into a crazy amount of detail about his fried chicken sandwich. You won't believe how many hours of prep goes into just one of these things. He also shares a two ingredient sandwich sauce that I've already used at a party as a dipping sauce to phenomenal feedback. Really, really great stuff in this episode. Danny, Danny's background isn't actually in the kitchen, but behind the bar. Uh, the first time I met him was when he invited me around to his friend's bar, where he was leading a cocktail class, and observing him making cocktails was fascinating. He's hugely adventurous and experimental, has lots of fun, but he's an absolute slave to technique and tradition. And this is a dichotomy that we also find in his food. This conversation starts with me asking Danny about his earliest memory of cooking. Enjoy. I must have been, I must have been in elementary school. I, uh, I'm sure I'd cooked things before this, but um, we went to Costco and bought a bunch of. Uh, they were like s- some sort of Chinese sausage. You know, they're like bright red, kind of spicy sausage. I don't know specifically what it was but we made this we bought a whole bunch of shrimp and i made fried rice in a wok with like you know a bunch of bunch of veg um this this spicy sausage and this shrimp and i remember watching the shrimp hit the pan and watching it go watching it it was raw shrimp and watching it turn bright pink and I was just so enamored by that. I thought it was so cool. Right. It, it turns from look. It turns from looking like fish to looking like food instantly. Instantly. Yeah. And it. And then just the all the flavors that were going into it and the the aromas. And I was just like, oh, we're creating we're creating this experience right now. And do you remember roughly how old you would have been then? I must have been twelve years old. And at twelve years there. old, did you know the the techniques for fried rice? Were you using? You know, dried rice from the day before. Definitely, we... I, I don't know what I, I don't know what I was doing, but it's like that that uh, you know that just the imp, the improvisation and the the intuition. You know, it's it's something that was it was a part of my my life, like cooking with my my family. It was just it was just so intuitive always with not just with that dish but with whatever whatever was being cooked cooked now that doesn't always translate to like everything being good like there was a lot of failures in there of course but it's always been that kind of like creative intuitive uh, experience well let's talk a bit about that because your introduction to cooking was one of of impulse and improvisation right. and you grew up to be a creative. Right. You you do music, you you now work uh mixing spirits professionally. Tell us about that journey. From uh from cooking to how it expanded into the rest of my life. I mean, it's it's so it's so connected that all of the the years of of cooking, balancing flavors, I mean, for for bartending, it's directly connected to to making cocktails. It's just very very simplified down uh, in some ways, I mean, people dig dig really into it. I try to keep it really simple, but it's that that idea of like finding finding the balance between, you know, in terms of cocktails, the citrus, the sweet, and your spirit, like taking the different components and and finding that perfect medium. So, for someone that doesn't understand cocktails, and I'll, I'll confess that I've never really given much thought to the composition of cocktails. What what is it that goes into a good cocktail? What's what's our kind of standard base ratio of ingredients that that, yeah, that that forms the cocktails that we. Well, that again, we I like to keep it super simple. Um, I, and especially now that I'm like, I'm really working with spirits in a real way. Um, 
I love the idea of taking a classic recipe that has three components. Let's say a gimlet, for example. Base spirit, maybe it's gin. Citrus, sweet. Putting them together, getting it ripping cold, and serving it in an ice cold coupe. Now, now let's take that that gin. Let's find some really interesting gin that has a really like beautiful backstory. Like maybe it comes from Argentina, and maybe the botanical build is is eucalyptus or something that's really abstract, and it has a totally unique uh, flavor profile. And then let's com- let's complement that with uh, some sort of compound simple syrup that has, you know, maybe we'll make a simple syrup with with basil or or Thai basil or something like that and uh fresh squeezed lime juice and just get the proportions right for the sweetness of the the gin and and you know the balance you know you you should be able to find it pretty easily and it'll make that that really interesting gin just become elevated and sing so you've been bartending professionally what for over a decade right 15 years now. And so you must you must have had customers which don't know what they like, right? Or at least articulate that they don't know what they right. like. But through a conversation, you work out what's going to please them. It's super common. It's a, it's one of the most common interactions is they... Well, I, I and I kind of like... Uh, I, I push for this kind of interaction because my favorite dining experience, my favorite thing is to go into a restaurant and for the server to come up to me and to take the menu out of my hand and be like, I'm your menu tonight. You don't need a menu. Great. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you what you want. I know this place. You don't know this place. Yeah. Like I'm going to take one look at you and I'm going to, and I'm going to, I'm just going to send some stuff out. I'm like, bring it on. That's exactly what I want. I love that experience. I'm so with you, right? Yeah. I, 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 it really bothers me when I go to a restaurant and I, the thing I will always say is just tell me what's good. Yeah. Right. And it really bothers me when a server's like, oh, well, you know, yeah. there's pizza and there's, just, I don't care what there is. Like, tell me what's good. Like, what would you regret me leaving this restaurant and having not tried? it's super rare to have that server that's super passionate about their, their, the place that they work and the food that, that's being served there. They're out there. But when you find that one and they're just, they're just like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to take the reins here. So, so, so let's return to these three staples, right? The spirit, the citrus, the, the or the acid and the, and the sweet, right? Yeah. And you're, these three combinations. Are you trying to read someone and go, I think they're going to like these kind of ratios or well, I think, well, my first, my first thing is, do you want to, do you want a citrus forward, refreshing, uh, shaken cocktail or do you want a spirit forward, stirred cocktail, Negroni, Manhattan, Sazerac, something like that. So I'll just ask these a couple quick questions just to get a read off them. My, you know, the, the question, uh, of like, do you have an, an aversion to any particular spirits? Uh, a lot of times, um, I like to break through that barrier because if someone's like, oh man, I hate rum. I drank a Gatorade bottle full of Bacardi when I was in college <laughs> exactly. and I just, I can't drink rum and I, I just can't drink rum. It's like, well, you know, that, ex- that experience notwithstanding, there's a wild world of amazing rums out there that are so different and so interesting. They're like, oh, I don't like rum, but I love bourbon. Like I'll give you 10 rums that drink like a, like bourbon that are, are, you know, like, or, 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 or whatever like that. So, so I try to break through those barriers whenever possible, but you know, if someone, someone will give you the, the spirits that they don't like and you can, you know, you can pretty easily eliminate those. They'll tell you they want something that's 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 refreshing and citrusy. It's like okay, we're gonna go in the the shaken. Uh, you know, maybe it's a gimlet daiquiri variation, something in there. Um, or if they're like, I want something sweet and I like rum. Like okay, cool, let's make a tiki drink. Or you know, if they if they like Negronis, then you could just you could improvise for days on that one. So there's all kinds of variations in so there. what does someone who's listening to this that still hasn't worked out what their cocktail is right that still is opening up a cocktail when you're going well here we go is this again yeah what sh- what should be their thought process i mean i f- for me when i look at a cocktail list and usually i'll just usually i'll just look at the back bar and if there's an interesting spirit i'll order a classic with that spirit because that's that's more what i'm into but a lot of people like to look at the original cocktails on the cocktail list and and pick one that that is interesting to them um i i, I like to you know, again, go spirit driven, like, uh, see if it's a really cool cocktail bar, let's see what they're doing with this mezcal that everybody else is using in their well, you know? And I have a a question from a personal perspective. Why is it whenever I'm on a date in a cocktail bar, no matter what drink I order, I always get the more effeminate looking glass than my date. (laughs) Oh man. 
um, yeah, it's tough to look out for that one. You can't really tell what it's going to, from the menu. No. It's almost impossible. I guess that's just the luck of the draw for you. <laughs> yeah. Is there no secret sign I can You like, just got to own it, buddy. Put this in a pint glass. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. And, and so you're obviously, you know, super passionate about cocktails. Before we started recording, you were waxing lyrical about spirits now. Right, right. You're looking to develop uh, your own spirit. Tell me, what, what's... What's the end game for you? When you're putting all this work into creating stuff, what are you really doing it for? Well, so the end game for me personally is I want to open an oyster bar with a cock, with, you know, like oyster bar, cocktail bar um, in this, uh, I live in this town called Situate. It's south of Boston. It's right on the ocean and it looks across, if you're familiar with like Cape Cod, it looks across the the bay to P-Town. You can see the P-Town tower on the horizon there. And this whole area is just like so rich with oysters. And I want to open a seasonal oyster bar in in one of those little towns there with a cocktail bar that's just open in the summer. Um, that's something that I've wanted to do for a really long time. But I'm taking my time to get there because I, I want to be completely prepared for it. And I want to have, you know, I've, I've been on this this journey, this like this culinary journey for so long. And I, I haven't reached a destination yet. And so I don't want to I don't want to settle down and start serving this food to people until I've I feel like I've, you know, accomplished more and, and learned a lot more. And so that's what I'm doing right now. And people that are coming to your oyster bar, they're they're there for your story, right? Exactly. What uh, what's gone into shape the story, or what, so, what parts of the story are not yet written? So the, you know, the beginning of the story, obviously, what we talked about is very much uh, just my family. You know, we cook; that's what we do, and so I've always cooked because of that. But really, where it started to get interesting is I when I moved out here to California about ten years ago for the first time, um, and Immediately, I was living in Berkeley, and uh, there, there's a supermarket there called Monterey Market. And I walked into this supermarket and just immediately had my mind blown by the unbelievable ingredients there. There's an aisle full of mu- mushrooms foraged from all over Northern California. I've never seen anything like that. Um, the produce was incredible. These ingredients were so fresh. I'm used to walking into a supermarket in in the Boston area and really like, you know, eight months out of the year, you're getting stuff that comes from California and the freshness is usually suspect and you're cooking with that stuff. And so now I'm going to these, this amazing, uh, this amazing grocery store to buy my produce. I'm working in this French restaurant that has a butcher shop that's getting these cuts of meat that I'm like, I'm like good friends with the butcher and they're like, I'm, I'm watching them break down, uh, you know, break down a pig and <clears throat> break down a, like a side of a cow. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm like learning about these cuts and I'm taking them home and I'm cooking with them. And the difference is it's massive, massive. So I got, I, I, you know, 10 years ago got into the, or realized the significance of the quality of the ingredients. And, and that, that, that kind of drove my, my culinary journey to this, this next step where I'm seeking that out. So, you know, fast forward five or so years, I was, uh, I moved back to Boston and I went to Europe, uh, with my mom and my sister. And we, we were, we flew to Barcelona, um, we stayed there for a couple of days and we rented a car and we drove up through the Pyrenees mountains and we stopped in this tiny little town in, in the South of France in the Pyrenees mountains to stay at this, this little Airbnb that was this house that was just hundreds of years old. And we went to this little butcher shop. Um, I just, I, I was like super romantic about the idea of going into this little town and going to the butcher shop, going to the little grocery store, going to the, the bakery to get some, you know, the, the classic uh, yeah, yeah. French thing. So we went to this butcher shop in this little town and I bought, it was, first of all, everything in that butcher shop was, you could see the difference. It's the cuts of meat are so beautiful. They're so rich and they're coming from these, these farms like down the street that have been, have this pedigree of, quality that's 
goes back hundreds of years. Like this butcher shop has probably been there for hundreds of years in some capacity, whether it's in the same location, like and and all of this these cuts of meat are coming from families that have been producing these cuts of meat for generations. And so there's this ped there's this pedigree of quality there. And I remember I bought these little lamb chops and we brought them back to this 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 ha- the super old house and we cooked in the backyard uh it was this it was this uh, apple orchard and i cooked them over these coals on like super super low uh this it was this really weird grill that they had we had a couple coals and we just cooked them on really hot heat just with salt and pepper and it was that was one of the most amazing things i've ever eaten these lamb chops because you could just that um you're you're tasting that that tradition you know so that that really impacted me and it cha- kind of changed the way that I cooked and the way that I thought about ingredients when I came back to the States. I was like, where can I find this? It's so much harder to find. I mean, you're not going to find that. You're not going to find that, that tradition in the same way, yeah. but you, you know, this, you're sure, you're sure not going to find that at S- stop and shop or whatever supermarket you go to. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? The, the lower the quality of the meat, the more work you have to do to it. Right. Um, I, I remember I, I was in Nigeria. I had this absolutely incredible goat, right? They, they basically had this this kind of open barbecue on the street, and what was distinctive about it was it was completely covered in seasoning, right? You you, you couldn't even see the meat underneath with this very thick, rich layer of kind of red pepper, I guess it yeah. was. Um, and I guess it's because you know the the when you can see the goats out there, right? They're they're not particularly fatty. They're, they're you know that. They're not particularly well nourished, um, and so I guess the, you know the way that they're cooking this this meat is super inventive, right? To try and you know create tenderness and and, and create flavor. Uh, it's interesting that when you're working with ingredients that are just so good, yeah, that they need almost nothing, nothing. doing to them, yeah. And you can do you can you can get a mediocre cut and do so much different stuff to it, but it's never going to be as good as that, mm. you know that that. Wherever you find it, that that like really special cut of meat, and there's something to be said. And you know, so I, I, uh, I guess this was this was before I I moved to California, but I had a another formative experience living in Maine, um, Southern Maine, which is just in in New England. Um, I I was living right on the coast in the fall. I was painting after I was living in New York, and I I was just I was living there. I was painting, I was, I was doing portraits of people's houses and I was also painting the house that I was living in and I was fishing a lot. So we, by, by doing portraits, you mean like you would, I would paint people's, yeah, like, uh, I don't know, uh, like Edward Hopper style, like, yeah. like paintings of, of houses. And you would also, and also I was simultaneously paint painting the exterior the outside of the, house. of the house. Were you painting the exterior first? So you didn't have to then modify your painting right, after you exactly. painted it. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, well, I was paint. I when I finished the house that I was working on, then I did paintings of that house, and it's right, okay, it's new color, um, like anyways, a bit of an upsell, a bit of a bonus. Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> would you like a record of the work? Exactly. So I was, I was fishing a lot in Southern Maine, and I, and I had fished a, a little bit in my life uh, before that, but I had never, you know, really like went through the process of catching a fish and breaking it down myself, and I caught. I caught my first bluefish on my own out there and I I don't know if you know much about you know how aggressive a bluefish is they have razor sharp teeth and they do not want you to take them out of the ocean they don't want to be caught cool. they don't want to be caught so I I had this experience of catching this bluefish and bringing it back to my house which is like right right near the ocean and you know dispatching it without really knowing I had never killed I had, I don't think I'd ever really killed anything at that point Um, you know, and I, and I, and I caught it with the intent on cooking it. And so I was looking this fish in the eye as I dispatched it. And that moment really stuck with me. And I don't, I didn't do necessarily a very good job of it because I didn't really have the knowledge. I was in my early twenties and I, you know, I hadn't done my research and I, I kind of got ahead of myself a little bit. Did you have some instinct? I had some instinct, but man, I, I didn't have the right tools. I might, the knife I had wasn't sharp enough. And I had it on a boogie board, just like in my driveway, and the neighbors were all looking at me. And they're like, "What is this guy doing right now?" It's a and very weird satanic ritual. Was, what cult yeah, was he entered? It was not. It wasn't pretty. And this fish was just looking at me. He was like, "Dude, you really botched the job on this one." <laughs> and and the fish is looking at you, going, "Shame <laughs> on you!" Yeah. But this stuck with me, and it's like, you, 
anything that you're cooking with, this is something that, uh, you know, it, it, it gave its life for this moment really, which yeah. is really sad, you know, and obviously, but you, you better honor that and you better, you know, do your, do your damnedest to make sure whatever you're cooking, um, you should be thoughtful about it. I think you're right. I think if there's a moral case for eating meat, which I myself do struggle with while also eating as much right. meat as I can eat, I think it's that, right? I think it's we've got to be super respectful of 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 the the animal, making sure that none of it's wasted. Yeah. Uh, and making sure that we, you know, we do our best to honor its life by making it as delicious as possible. Right. Cuz maybe if it knew, right? Maybe if the maybe if the cow knew <laughs> that eventually it was going to end it up. Was gonna like be this, super, I mean, if you knew that you were eventually going to be a delicious, delicious meal. Yeah, like maybe, <laughs> maybe I would. You know, maybe I'd go. Oh, do I need to work out? Or you know, what what do you need from me? Yeah. Maybe if that's maybe if that is my life purpose, that one day I'm going to be slaughtered and cooked. Maybe that's exciting. Maybe I can work towards that exciting. and be the best I can I like be at thinking it. about that. So are you more of a meat guy or a fish guy? I mean, I I probably eat. Um, I try to eat more fish, but I, I cook more meat right now just because I have more access to it. Yeah. Um, and there's a over, big barbecuing culture in this part of the world, isn't there? Yeah, for sure. I mean, over oh, this past summer, I was living right, right on the beach in, in Situate, and I um, and I was fishing a lot, and so I was eating more. I was making a lot of crudo, and I was eating, eating a lot of fish. Um, but right now, I just I've been on this been on this chicken thing man and that's that's really taken over so how how have the chickens taken over I, well so like chicken run yeah exactly so i um i kind of stumbled i've been you know i've been cooking fried chicken in in different capacities for my whole life cuz just because it's one of my favorite things to eat and so um, absolutely with you on that yeah and so it's been this it's been this uh evolving process which started with you know we can get into the the specifics of the technique um but it started with the like italian style like chicken parmesan you know right so i've i've never had this in italy but i've had this in australia do you know this they're absolutely mad for chicken really? parma in australia literally the first day i was there i went into a pub um and the, all the people there were just waxing lyrical about this dish. They're like, yeah. You've not had a chicken parma in your life? They were excited about this moment. Uh, and it's exciting. Well, I, mean, <laughs> I don't think it's necessarily a, a particular culinary breakthrough the way they right. do it. But um, for those who haven't had it, it's basically breaded chicken, right? So it's chicken in breadcrumbs, which yep. I imagine they cook by doing a kind of a standard flour, egg, then yep. breadcrumb. Uh, and then they put a tomato sauce on top. Right. And then cheese. And then that's melted. And then what they seem to do in Australia is add gravy, uh, which I like to think is a, a little British uh, inf yeah, <laughs> influence. Yeah, sounds like it. And it's not bad. They serve it with chips, which seems a bit much. It's not bad, but I imagine I imagine if I had one in Italy, it'd be nicer. But maybe they don't do them in Rome. I've only been to Rome. I don't Rome. know if they do. I mean, if, if, as far as I know, it's like an American-Italian Oh um, yeah, possibly. Yeah, that you know, makes sense. It's like the it's the Italian sub shops in the Boston suburbs where you can go and get a chicken parm sub. Right, and that is that's just like one of my favorite things in the world. It's like super nostalgic. The thing that I find a bit odd about the chicken parm is, for me, one of the appeals of fried chicken is you have a lovely crispy skin. Right, which is then undermined by adding sauce on top. Yep, isn't it? Well, I think one of the most exciting fried chickens is Korean fried chicken because yeah. they manage. I don't know how they do it, but they manage to create a crispy skin, then cover it in sauce, but the chicken stays crispy. Yeah. I don't really see a cutlet. And I, when I think of fried chicken, I don't really think of chicken cutlets. Yeah. Right? There's more to fried chicken than that, isn't there? Absolutely. But but in the context of a sandwich, the yeah. cutlet, uh, you know... It's, it's the right shape. It's the right shape for that. So so that, that, that um, you know, going from the chicken parm, eventually schnitzel came into my world. Right. And so I started making schnitzel with pork and chicken. Um, but I, Which is a very similar process, right? Very, yeah, so super similar. For me, it was exactly the same. It's just what I... <laughs> Maybe it's just the same dish with a different name. Yeah, no, I mean, basically, <laughs> uh, with just different different fixings. But, um, yeah. but I, the process of taking a pork tenderloin 
and hammering it out to be the size of a dinner plate. Yeah. Super thin. Yeah. That was so cool and exciting. Yeah. It's like, okay, now this, this, you've made it super thin and we're frying it in one at a time and it's taking up the whole frying pan. Um, and then th- there's so much cool stuff you can do with that. Um, so that was really exciting. So for a long time, that was my, my world of fried chicken was, was that, that process of. So, so far you're only frying chicken breasts that you're turning into cutlets. Pretty early on, I started using thighs. Good on you. Pretty early on. And I was using boneless, skinless thighs um, just because they were so easy to get. Yeah. Um, but I know, but the, the fat content uh, and, and like it just, for me, it, um, and I, I love all the, the little nasty bits on a chicken thigh when you pound it out to make schnitzel. Yeah, yeah. When you deep fry that, I, I think it just, if you do that with a breast, it just, it seems it's just it falls it falls a little flat. For it's, me it is. It's very one dimensional kind yeah. of meat. It's funny how the chicken breast is held in such high regard in this country. Right. Same in the UK. I don't understand it. Whereas chicken thigh is the cheaper cut, right? Whereas you go yeah. to Southeast Asia, the opposite is true. They think the breast is a complete waste of time. Right. It's cheaper to buy chicken breast than it is to buy chicken thigh, which is a very prized cut. Yeah. Because it is more delicious. I wonder whether we're in signature dish territory. You seem to be. It, your eyes are lighting up whenever you're talking about. I'm this ready. Chicken. I'm ready to go. <laughs> So tell me what your signature dish is. So, hold on. Uh, my, <laughs> my signature dish, it turns out, is a fried chicken sandwich. The, the origin story we've already kind of covered through, through chicken parm into schnitzel. And then somewhat recently, within the last two years, I kind of, uh, I, I got into, you know, I was working at this restaurant in Boston and they did like a Nashville hot fried chicken. Uh, you're going to have to tell me what that is. Uh, Nashville hot fried chicken is uh, this this uh, Nashville tradition of fried chicken where it's super spicy. It's a lard-based hot sauce. Um, so they're doing like a traditional southern fried chicken, and then they're tossing it in um, in this lard-based super, super spicy hot sauce. And it's like they serve it on a piece of white bread, you know, like Texas toast yeah. with some pickles. And it's covered in this incendiary hot sauce. So this hot sauce is like a like a buffalo wing sauce. It's more of it's it's thick. Yeah. And it's fatty, and it's deep, like it's a deeper red color, and um, and it is, it's it's a it's a really intense, intensely hot and spicy. And what kind of chicken are we talking about here? Um, leg breast and a thigh. And it's like battered, like southern fried chicken. Yeah, so they do. They do it. Te- they were doing a. They were doing a technique at, at State Park, and this is the, you know the, the fried chicken at State Park. For my money, is some of the best fried chicken in the world. Um, State Park in, in Kendall Square, uh, in outside of Boston, and there's uh, they cook the chicken in a CVAP, uh, so it it maintains a lot of the moisture. What's this? Um, so a CVAP is a, uh, I don't, I don't know the full name of a CVAP, uh, or what CVAP is short for, but it basically, um, it, it, it's not dissimilar from steaming, but it's a way to, it, they, they, they use moisture to cook the chicken. Yeah. Um, it's not, everybody has this. It's really hard to, to come by. Is it like a, a deep fat fryer that also steams it? I would it? imagine that it's, it's not dissimilar from that. Yeah. I don't know a ton about these deep, these, 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 uh, air fryers. Sure. But so, I feel so, like so, an air fryer and a CVAP are probably similar pieces of equipment. Because I guess like, when you're in a commercial kitchen, you've got loads of, op- loads of options to cook chicken. Right. But when you're frying chicken at home, I guess you're using what, a standard pan? Right, or you know, whatever, whatever or a deep you fryer. Have. So, so what they're doing is they're they're it's fully cooked in the CVAP, and then they're they're dredging it and frying it, and then they they oh, do it and they do okay, and see. then and they do a double fry. Right, so it's like it's kind of the chicken's almost being blanched before it's being fried. Exactly. So that oh, so that uh, in the frying process, you don't have to worry about cooking it. You're just worrying about getting the perfect skin. Skin. So, yeah, that's interesting. So I, I saw them making this fried chicken. I worked with it for many years, and um, and somewhat recently, I really deep I I deep dived into uh into this fried chicken sandwich recipe. I was I was using so many different things and. Um, I got this, I got David Chang's cookbook, um, and I, I went to his restaurant with a bunch of friends and I had this amazing experience eating his fried chicken. It was unbelievable. What was good about it? Um, the, we did the two whole chickens, the Southern style and the Korean style. Um, it was the, the format. 
I mean, the chicken was cooked perfectly. Everything, it hit all the points. It was, it was moist. It when was, you say a whole chicken, the chicken wasn't cooked all in one. No, it, it was, was cut it was, up. It was cut into pieces. Yeah, right. So we had two piles of chicken. Oh, incredible. Um, in two different styles. But, the, but it's served with, uh, he serves it in this really cool Korean style with lettuce wraps and like all the cool oh, amazing. sauces, gojigong and like, uh, this scallion ginger sauce. And, um, that it, sounds it great. just, for me, like that I had this moment of eating that, pulling apart a chicken thigh and putting it into a, le- a fried chicken thigh, um, putting it into a, this lettuce wrap. Bit of chili sauce. With the chili sauce. And it was just, it was perfect. It was, yeah. it was incredible. And um, so I, I, I started, you know, and, and I, I love karage. I love the Japanese style of fried chicken. Which is famously has no sauce on it. Right. Exactly. Have you ever had chicken namban? No, what's that? So chicken namban is another Japanese fried chicken dish, which seems to be less known, which does have sauce on it. So what they do is they... Um, they do use chicken thigh normally. They bread it in a slightly different way to karage, so it's it's got like a more kind of consistent coating on the outside, right? So it's not um it looks a bit more like a batter and it's a lot lighter. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that they'll put uh, like a mayonnaise and egg mixture. Oh cool. Um like a, you know, boiled egg kind of chopped up with mayonnaise and a couple of different uh spices. Where does this come from? Well, that's a good question. So Namban, what does Nam? Well, I, well, I imagine it's that's a that's a Chinese origin. Thing. Yeah, um, that's a good question. You've you've caught me out there, uh, but certainly the name would suggest that it's it's been imported. Uh, cool. But it seems to be the only time that the that in the Japanese cooking tradition they're happy to put sauce. Yeah, uh, on on fried chicken, and it is absolutely delicious. So so one of the t- techniques that I was drawing from is this this recipe that that. Uh, he has in his book, um, David Chang has in his book, that's, uh, it's fried chicken. They, they break down, well, first of all, he gets an amazing chicken, which is crucial to this whole thing. He gets So an do ama- you think the quality of the chicken matters with fried chicken? I, do, I absolutely do. And so I, I, I So fresh, not frozen? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and he gets this amazing chicken. I haven't actually, I don't, I don't know where he, I think, I don't know where you can get this in California. But it's, I can only imagine it's the chicken that, that we had at his restaurant, um, which was incredible. And so uh, then he, he breaks it apart. He brines it in uh, salt sugar brine for somewhere between two and six hours. Then he steams it for 45 minutes. And then he lets it sit in the fridge for at least two hours. It kind of like congeals and comes together. Oh. And after 45 minutes at medium heat steaming, it's completely cooked. Yeah. And then it goes into the fridge and it kind of congeals. And then now to this point, it's just been brined. Nothing's been put onto the chicken. And then it goes into the deep fryer at 375 degrees um, for six to eight minutes. And there's no batter. He's just, this is like. You but, know, he, but he's dried the skin out a bit in the fridge, yeah, it seems. exactly. And then it comes, and of course it comes to room temperature after it's been in the fridge. And then, and then he fries it and then he takes that out and tosses it in some sauce which has bird's eye chilies, uh, scallions, ginger, and all kinds of stuff. He has his recipe for it. I've like I played around with different recipes for it, but like that process of then taking this chicken that's cooked just it's so beautiful and like it's simple but it's still it's still moist and cooked perfectly and then tossing it in this in this sauce with with ginger and chilies and stuff like that and then just serve on on a on a brown paper bag. Like rustic, simple, delicious. I played around with that for a while and tried to use, you know, use that in the sandwich. And that was cool. Those were good. But the sandwich, I felt like still needed that. It needed that crust. It needed some of that Southern uh, inspiration. Uh, Let, so let's pause for a moment here then. So what we've learned so far is you like chicken with sauce, right? And you yeah, like sure. it spicy. And you seem to have a preference for chicken that's been, um, that, that's had like a flour breading rather than like a batter. Yeah. Am I right so far? Yeah, I mean, so so basically, to take a step back, all these different styles have their their purposes. I'm looking for something very specific for this sandwich that I've been working on. Uh, so I had some of the other components of the sandwich: um, this red cabbage slaw. Uh, this. How are you making that? So the red cabbage slaw is it's super simple. It's red cabbage, chop, red cabbage top, chopped really really thin. Uh, serrano chilies, ginger, garlic. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll throw some mint and cilantro into there, uh, and just, uh, rice wine vinegar and some lime juice and just, uh, put a plate on top of it in the fridge, let it sit for a few hours. So is it slightly tangy? This? It is. Yeah. It's tangy. It's spicy. Um, and it's super crispy. Yeah. Um, nice. so that was a component that I've always used on my sandwiches. I make these pickles that are like somewhere between, uh, 
like a dill and and a B and B. They're like they're they're spicy, but they're a little bit sweet and and uh, and they're they're not they're they're relatively quick. Like they're they're still have a good amount of crisp to them. Um, and then but again, ha- super acidic, I imagine. Yeah, right? pretty just acidic. like the slaw. Yeah, and then um, then there's this aioli that I make with um, it's this. I don't even know what this stuff is called, but it's, I found it in, in like Asian grocery stores and it's, it's crispy chilies and garlic, like fried chilies and garlic and oil. And it gets super condensed. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, are you talking about, um, Rayu? Uh, maybe I don't, I don't remember what it's called. I've used different kinds of it. Um, I, I think I can imagine myself. exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, and it's like soup. You have to stir it up. You have to like yeah, get yeah, all yeah, the yeah, chilies yeah, out yeah, of it. Exactly. Yeah, you yeah. only need a little bit. Put in an aioli, and it turns the aioli bright orange. Um, I've never thought of doing this. This is a great idea because because yeah. uh, what you get because what's great about these jars, right? You can buy one jar. You can continue to top it up with oil, exactly. and the oil will still get exactly. flavored for yeah. for as long as you want. For sure. So, Super popular in Hong Kong cooking as well, right? I I would only imagine. So I I if I have time, I make the, I make the aioli. Um, and, and then and I add the, and then I add that, uh, and how do you make an aioli? So I, I do just a super simple in a, in a Cuisinart, uh, egg yolks, um, uh, neutral oil. I, I like to use a blend of, uh, I actually like to use a blend of olive oil and grapeseed oil. Yep. Um, just great a, olive oil here in San Francisco. Oh, it's too, incredible. It? It's yeah. incredible. And just a little bit of Dijon mustard, some salt. Uh, I do it in a Cuisinart cause I just don't have the chops to do it in a bowl quite yet, but, sure. um, I'm working on it. But, uh, you know, if not, I'll just use, I'll just use, if I don't have the time, I'll just use mayonnaise. I'll just buy some good mayonnaise. And then you're adding a little bit of this chili oil. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it to taste um, and to color. I, I, you know, like I want it to be bright orange. Nice. Um, yeah. And so uh, those are those are the, the components. So let's talk about the chicken. So <clears throat> uh, uh, finally, the bread. Right. Oh, no, well, so of course, uh, I've not found these in California, but my best case scenario bread is they're called Martin's potato rolls. They make them in Boston. They sell them at all the grocery store stores. They're cheap. They're seeded, like sesame seeded potato rolls. And I are they soft? They're soft. They're super soft. And uh, I I just hit them in clarified butter and sear them on the, on the of course. Yeah, nice. You know. Um, and, and tell me about these rolls. Are they kind of like sweet, like a brioche? No, they're not as sweet as brioche. Uh, they're more neutral than brioche. They're like your classic. Like New England hamburger roll. See, I was going to ask, could you use them for a hamburger? Absolutely. Then? And they're round. They're round. That's interesting because when I think of a chicken sandwich, I think of like a sub shape, like a rectangle. Yeah. So these are soft. They're round. Um, th- you can't get them out here, but so I try to find. I've, uh, I'll use brioche in a pinch, but I do think the brioche is a little bit sweet. It does hold up to to uh, frying on the pan with with butter a little bit better than the, the Martin's potato rolls. But um, you know, I, I'm trying to find that perfect potato roll. I haven't quite gotten to the step where I'm going to make my own potato rolls, but that is definitely in the cards. Um, what, 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 what is a potato roll? Is it using potato to make the roll? I would imagine, I don't know that some kind of potato starch. Or yeah. Maybe I honestly, I don't know how they make these Martin potato rolls, but I'd love to find out because they're incredible. So we've got this roll. We've sliced it in half. We've uh, covered it in clarified butter. We've put it on the grill. And we've toasted it. Yep. Then I guess on the bottom bun, we're putting the sauce first. We're putting yeah aioli. aioli on the bottom bun, pickles, pickles, then slaw, pickles, chicken down, okay, and S- then and then on the top bun, we're doing aioli and we're doing uh, this chili, I mean sorry, this scallion ginger, um, like salsa basically. Oh, nice. On the aioli on the top bun, and then the chicken's down and the slaws on top of the on top of the chicken, top it, and then it gets and then it gets. This is so crucial, and we'll get to this when we talk about the chicken. There's two really crucial steps. Is the top one goes on and it just gets a little crush, little push. You have to crush it down yeah. a little bit, and then wrapped in paper. And I, I'm a firm believer that like this sandwich is gonna be its best when it's been wrapped in paper and it's sat for like 10, 15 minutes at least to congeal. It's to almost like the together. ideal delivery burger, then. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I can imagine everything apart from the chicken. Here's the things that I can't currently imagine. I can't imagine the shape. Right? How are you getting chicken to be round? Okay. Can't imagine right. what the outside's good. Can't imagine what the outside's looking like. I still don't know if we're doing like a flour dredging or So let's let's talk about this chicken. So yeah. so I'll just I'll just walk you through my technique and, and, and what what we've covered so far is it's a mixture of of karage techniques, uh, Korean techniques and southern techniques. Um, so we'll take bone in, skin on chicken thighs. Fantastic. Already I'm with you. Bone in, skin on chicken thighs. 
I'm going to brine them in the David Chang style uh, salt sugar brine about two hours. And, and what's your ratio for this brine? It's a half cup of uh, sugar, half cup of salt, four cups of water. Okay. Um, I'm going to brine them for two, three hours. Is there such thing as brining chicken too much? If you were to put yeah, that in overnight, yeah, for sure, it would get too salty. Right. Okay. Or it would get, uh, yeah, it would get. I don't know. I don't know what else would happen, but my my interpretation is that it would get too salty. I mean, I've had overbrined pork chops, and like, then you got to like use them in a stew or something because yeah. they're a little bit too I, salty. And have you not thought about adding anything else to this brine? Like, a I've pe- thought about it, or? but I there's so much else going on here mm. that I think that just having that first that base level of brine is enough. And here. what you're looking for here is to kind of tenderize the meat, is that right? Sure. With the brining. Yeah. And I, I kind of... A bit of flavor. A, yeah, exactly. A bit of flavor. So um, it, sits in, it sits in the brine for two hours. This is a crucial part. After it comes out of the brine, the next step is steaming it. It's got to sit and come to room temperature out of, the, out of the water. So I take it out of the water and I put it in a, in a pan and I just I let it sit on the counter for an hour until it's completely room temperature. Cause I don't want to put it in that steam when it's cold. Cause it'll, it'll toughen up the meat. It'll make it get, uh, it'll, it'll make it like tense and tough and like put some strain on that skin. You know what I'm saying? So I'll let it sit, come to room temperature. And then I have a big, uh, like industrial steamer and medium heat for 45 minutes. I'll steam these thighs. And what happens to the skin while you're steaming it? So, the skin, it, it cooks through, but the skin is like soft and rubbery and ready to get super crispy, which is beautiful. Right. Because right now I'm kind of imagining the chicken is looking like, have you ever had Singaporean chicken rice? Yeah, exactly. Is that how it's kind of looking yeah, right exactly. now? Yeah, so exactly. Like a bit pasty. Super pasty. It looks, it's not super appetizing looking. Yeah. But so at this point, we take the thighs out, we put, we put them in the in the refrigerator for two hours and we let them just sit and congeal and they each form into these little units with a fat, like a little fat uh, cap underneath them. And they're really cool. And you just plop them out and then... Oh, so most of the fat has now been rendered out of the of the thigh. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. So so we take them out of the fri- fridge after two hours and again, we let them come back to room temperature. Already we're like six hours into this dish, aren't we? Yeah, so the prep on these thighs does take a little bit of while, a, a little while, but... Uh, if you could do it all ahead of, t- ahead of time, you can actually have a super quick pickup on these sandwiches. But so this is the crucial step. So I found the in re- the reason why I use the bone in skin on thighs is because cooking them, steaming them with the bone in, um, I feel like produces uh, just a much better end product than using a, a boneless, skinless thigh. I can absolutely believe it. I'm sure right? the bone imparts flavor. I'm sure it helps keep it structure also, as well. Of course. After you after you steam it and let it sit in the fridge, when you take it out, you can do one cut down the back and a turn. That bone pops right out. Right. So easy. So, and it's beautiful. And then you have these beautiful thighs with the skin on, just totally ready to go. So I pop the bones out of all of them, and then I do a flour, AP flour, with just a little bit of cornstarch. That's just salt and pepper. Um, or no, I'm, and then of course I use the buttermilk. So buttermilk first, I take the buttermilk and I use some of that chili oil from before. I pour some of that oil into the buttermilk, right? Um, I pour some of that buttermilk into my AP flour with a little cornstarch and I just kind of whisk it around to make these little flaky crumbly bits in the flour. And what, what happens is you go into the buttermilk, you go into the flour, and those flaky crumbly bits stick to the outside, and they make those flakes those that, that maybe so you've seen. So you're actually like putting soda. some of this chili into the flour? Yeah. Well, it's going into, it's going into the buttermilk. Sorry, the buttermilk. And I'm whisking around, and then I'm pouring some of that buttermilk chili mixture just a little bit into the flour and whisking it around, and it makes these little globular uh, bits in the flour. So do that before I, b- I batter each one. Right. Okay. And it's these little bits that are becoming the They're kind of the crispy little bits. flaky, crispy bits on the outside. And and I've a beat it. I've done it without pouring that in. Oh my god, it makes a huge difference. Right. So then, so then we're, um, so then we're taking our chicken that's been in the buttermilk. It's been floured. It's gone through all these other steps. How long has it been in the buttermilk for? 
Just I, ju- I just co- just totally totally cover it. Okay. It doesn't, I don't I don't let it sit in the butter milk. Are too you long. putting any flour on before you put it in the buttermilk? No. So it's just take the chicken as it is. Once you've taken the bone out in the buttermilk, then straight into the flour. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And how is it looking? Is it looking like completely covered? covered? Yeah. Completely covered. I make sure that it's completely covered. Yeah. Um, and at this point, I let them sit out for a little bit. Um, once they've all been properly battered, on a on a baking tr- on a little baking sheet. So that uh, it doesn't have complete contact, so they can sit out and kind of the whole thing can air out, yeah. um, or like a rack, I should say, a baking rack. And then I'm going into a. Um, I use a, a, like a deep um, kind of cassoulet uh, Dutch oven to fry. Oh, okay, right. right. Um, and I get my oil, a uh, blend of canola oil and vegetable oil to 375 degrees and I do a triple fry that is quick triple fry 30 seconds in 30 seconds out 30 seconds in 30 seconds out 30 seconds in and then all at the same temperature all the same temperature and then at this point the chicken is like a perfect golden brown (laughs) so so it's just perfect so I'll take that out we're getting really close to the end here. I'll put this. I'll put this chicken on a cutting board, and Final then stretch. here's the crucial. This is like the last part. But our sandwich is all ready. Everything's ready to go. It's ready to go on the sandwich. I will take this piece of chicken, put a piece of tin foil over it, and I'll just kind of crush it down a little bit. It'll break all the sinew inside of this this yeah. chicken thigh, and it'll just make it so that when you bite into it, you can get a clean, succinct bite. You're not pulling anything out. You're not pulling the thigh out of the sandwich. You know, it's been it's been kind of crushed a little bit, and it's of course the chicken's so tender inside, so tender you can just bite little bits off. Yeah, so that so that goes onto the sandwich. Top goes on, it gets wrapped and served. Who have you cooked this for? I've cooked this for probably like 30, 40 people at this point through dinner parties at uh, my buddy's house. We're getting ready to do a pop up at this place, neck of the woods in Richmond, in the Richmond district, where we have access to a full kitchen. Um, and then the goal is to continue to do these pop-ups and then see where that takes us. The thing that I pride myself on and something that is so important to me is the architectural integrity of the sandwich. The flavors are all there. It's balanced. Like I think that all the components going into, into it are balancing it. It's the right amount of citrus. It's the right amount of sweet. It's the right amount of spicy. Um, the crunch is unparalleled on the sandwich. Um, and like, you know, the bread is is just it's not causing any problems the bread's not too hard you can you can bite through the whole sandwich you're not making a mess with this sandwich there's there's a couple different styles of of chip fridging and sandwiches like but this is like your clean uh easy to eat like deep complexity of flavor but ar- architecturally sound fried chicken sandwich that was Danny Oh, he was so much fun to talk to. And he was one of those guests that was properly inspirational because the moment I finished this conversation, I made sure I got myself straight to Japantown and bought all of the ingredients to make my Japanese karaage. And I made sure to buy the ryu and QP mayonnaise so I could replicate his burger sauce. I made a dipping sauce for my chicken and goodness me, it was delicious. Uh, Danny, such a super interesting, generous guy. The day before I left San Francisco, we did a living room comedy show at my friend's house. I invited Danny over and he brought a massive, great big crate of alcohol and spirit samples. We spent the entire night drinking them, got to about midnight. We decided to turn the barbecue on, stick a cast iron pan on and just grab a load of leftovers and food that was knocking about to try and create some new dish. And Danny's exactly the kind of person that I enjoy spending time with in the kitchen. Just super fun, really experimental. And goodness me, what a fried chicken sandwich. My main regret is I haven't yet tried it, uh, but I look forward to doing so one day. Danny, if you're listening to this, I'm still waiting. Um, So that was episode two. Episode three is going to come out next week. If you'd like to be the first to know, then please do subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening to it. Uh, If you'd like to get in touch, then you can do so using the email address podcast at Pona dot app that's podcast at pona p-o-n-a dot app you can find me on instagram at ollie horn picks all that's left to do is to say goodbye and see you next week
peel six cloves of garlic and finely mince. 